this is Rob Powell and today in Tech Stirwa Talks we're talking to Peter Schep of EF Pro Cycling about training during the coronavirus. Alright, welcome back listeners. Thanks for tuning in to a new episode of the Tech Turbo Talks. Uh, we've got another ripper guest for you this show. After hearing uh, Stenek Stibar and Gino Meder on the previous podcast, where they were talking about their training and the indoor racing in these strange times, uh, we thought let's mix it up a little bit for this week. And we thought it would be a good idea to dive a little bit deeper into how you guys at home can actually stay fit, can stay healthy, while obviously making good use of your tax trainers. So today's guest will provide you all with some help and he was so kind to even create like a three-week training plan for you all um, just to stay fit. And as we only want the best for our listeners, we asked the head of performance of EF Pro Cycling to help us out. So without further ado, welcome Peter Schep. Peter, how are you? Um, not too bad. We have some good weeks, uh, some sunny weeks in Holland where I live but of course the current situation is is challenging and yeah um, I'm a bit frightened of course because uh, I think everybody realizes that the virus um, will bring us in a in a really serious situation but yeah for me personally it's uh, it's challenging as a trainer and yeah Stay some more time at home uh, compared to last season during the winter. I'm traveling between Spain, where we have our headquarters, uh, our service schools in uh, in Girona. So I'm every like in average every three four weeks. I'm there for uh, at least a few days or a week. And so every now and then, I'm also joining the guys uh, during the race, especially with uh, the time trials in. All right, that's uh, that's great to hear. So yeah, obviously for the people who don't know Peter, um, as we already said, head of performance at the moment by EF Pro Cycling. But before that, a pretty handy cyclist himself, a former road and track cyclist, biggest achievements uh, probably on the track, specialized in the endurance events, a four times Olympian, uh, six medals at world championships, including one world title in the points race, uh, seven victories in six days races. But then, unfortunately, forced to retire in 2013. That's basically when you would turn the coach. And it started at the Dutch track team, didn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, 2013, um, I got injured. And I was, yeah, like pretty bad. And that age, um, I didn't want to go for a surgery uh, with a long recovery time. So I decided to quit cycling. Um, but during my... 2012 season, I already started the education internally with the federation to become a trainer, um, which is pretty easy to start for me straight from the bike as an assistant uh, trainer uh, from our head coach on the track and work as a talent coach with uh, juniors and under 23s in the endurance events, which made a lot of fun and was really helpful for me to grow into this uh, kind of new world for me on the other side of the, from, from the bike. And I did that in combination with uh, trainership, uh, with road cycling, and I worked for SEG Racing, uh, Continental Team in Holland. They have a lot of, in the meantime, famous pro cyclists. And yeah, that was a, a really nice time and also the I really enjoyed the, the combination of road and track. And yeah, I think it was pretty easy uh, and a pretty shortcut to go for the, the track as a first step. But uh, when the chance came last year uh, to have a chat with uh, Jonathan Fortas from this team, I didn't expect this chance so early in my uh, training career. But yeah. Um, I was pretty focused and pretty sure about going as a head coach to the Olympics uh, planned in Tokyo for this summer, which is not going to happen. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, I had to decide uh, to quit the track again. And I felt pretty sorry for the people I started the project with from 2016 to 2020. But you're never sure if this chance will uh, be there uh, one year later. So, 
I decided to quit and to explain my situation. And this was kind of my dream to enter uh, the world tour and, and work with the, the guys on the road. So, yeah. So what was the message uh, when uh, Jonathan Folders uh, called you or sent you a message? He was like, Peter, I need a head of performance and I want you to help me out. Um, yeah, I think his specific question was um, that he was looking for a guy who was also like uh, practically, um, how do you say that? I'm, I'm more a self-made trainer from experience and, and learning, but way more from experience. And I think this team is really based on practical things and ideas um, and work together. So I, I want to bring the ideas in, then we discuss it. And if it's doable, we, we go for it. And that was basically what he was looking for. So not uh, a top scientist, but more um, just some practical things um, and, and using the science and also the experience coming from the track, because on the track we are really focused on the details around uh, aero testing. Um, and, and that's also part of my job now uh, to work with uh, TT stuff uh, according to materials, positions, testing, etc. Um, so I think uh, his question fits really well to my background. Um, so I was really happy to work for him. So, so what is it that it, uh, that your job holds now? Is it like training, nutrition, but also maybe no, mental no, no, aspect, gear or equipment? No, or? It's definitely not uh, nutrition. Of course, we speak with our nutritionists, but yeah, uh, that's another department. Um, and of but course, more the performance is really focused on everything on the bike. Yeah, I got the overview of uh, all training plans. So we work with uh, the platform uh, Training Peaks, which is one of our partners from the team. Um, and I'm working on the overview. Um, we have created a dashboard uh, with all info from Training Peaks into our platform to get a, a clear view, also really easy to use for our uh, sports directors because uh, one part of my job is get the data in in kind of a simple way as a as an input for every single race to make the race strategies for the for the ds so every ds going to a race is is free to go in way of strategy and my input uh, with the data and experience can help to make the right decisions in this way. Um, the whole team is divided between uh, some internal trainers, uh, which includes myself. Um, so for example, I got five riders personally. Um, so I make the daily plans for them. And the overview is just to take a look if everything is going well, to keep contact with the, with the personal trainers from those guys. And if it's necessary to discuss some training topics. Uh, another part is, uh, like you mentioned, uh, the testing, the uh, development of different materials uh, around the TT, specific the TT bars in combination with the uh, last year's track testing. And now we do uh, road field testing, which is way easier. It, takes some time, but of course it's uh, logistically pretty complicated to organize uh, some track testing because you need a, a velodrome, uh, you need the riders, you need mechanics, you need the materials. And during the season it's pretty complicated to get that done. And now I started last winter with the uh, field testing, so you can pick the agenda from the riders and if they are in Spain, Girona or in home situation where I can can go, it's pretty easy to work with them, and it's also better because some guys are not really used to go on the track. Um, so then the results might be not that valid if you compare it with uh, just going on the road, which is pretty similar to a race, of course. So yeah, that's uh, the main part of my job. 
Okay, because obviously last season, a lot of great successes. And I think a lot of cycling fans noticed there was a massive improvement already in time trials, team time trials for EF. Uh, people started talking about the, the secret of uh, Peter Schep behind it all. Uh, what was that secret? Can you share something of that? Or? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I have to laugh about it because, uh, uh, like I said before, um, the cooperation between the, the people in the team and in the staff is, uh, is really amazing. Um, I have enjoyed that really as a big success, um, working together. And I think we bring some ideas in and it's not just my topic. It's just uh, I want to explain what I'm doing. I want to work together with uh, the riders that they understand the ideas and also the DESs. And I need the input from the DS if it's working well in the race and also working on the power strategies. That's exactly the same. Uh, I need their input because I'm not always there in the race and also not in the preparation. So, for example, the team time trials, um, I have a really short connection with the DS at the race there and, and also the days before when we do some trials for the team time trial. Um, working on the lineup, that's really important in the, in the team. Um, and then I need the experienced eyes and thoughts from the uh, DS. So we have to work together and it's the same working together with our partners, with Andreas Clear, who is uh, responsible for from our team to the partners uh, around all materials. So um, he's really important for our team and I'm working together with him to try uh, and get the best setups for the, the time trials. And I think that's the biggest secret. Um, what we do from the staff, what we're able to do. And of course, we have some great riders with the biggest engines and, and we are working just on, on the small details. But of course, the details can make the difference. But without any engine, you're not going to win a time trial. <laughs> Uh, talking about those engines, uh, you mentioned you still coach about five riders. Uh, which riders are you still coaching? Uh, it's Julius Vandenberg. He's still a young rider. It's Moreno Hofland. He's already more experienced. Seb van Mark, who's one of the biggest classic riders in the world. It's Christopher Halverson. He's uh, the former world champion under 23. Also big potential um, and I'm really excited to work on specific sprint efforts with him um, because of my background with the uh, track. Uh, sp sprint speed is, is always important there so uh, I'm using some, some stuff from the track with him. Um, the fifth rider is uh, a new one, Magnus Kort Nielsen and yeah, he's He's like a, a multi-talent. He he can do uh, climbing, sprinting, whatever. Um, so that's a really. I got really excited when start working with him because I, of course, I knew him as a rider, his name, and watching TV, uh, win some stages in in Grand Tours. But when I checked his training data, I was like, how is this possible? Um, <laughs> but it is, and he showed already some some good results in, in the early races. Um, and yeah, he's also a great rider to work with. So um, I'm really happy with those guys and and also the, the mix. So one is a young rider, one is experienced and um, going for uh, specific things as uh, TTs or sprints or uh, the big classics. That's, that's really a big challenge for me and I really like it. And how is it to coach those guys in in the current times in these situations? What's different than maybe like a couple of months ago and how are you adapting to it? Yeah, that's really hard. Um, but important for our team is uh, that we speak with the trainers and coaches every week in a, in a Tuesday call. So 10 o'clock on Tuesday, that's a, that's a fixed uh, note in the agenda that we speak together. We speak speak through all cases of riders if they're struggling and of course there's a huge difference between guys uh, living in Holland or Belgium or uh, Norway even if it's for a solo ride they're allowed to go outside uh, which is a huge difference compared to guys who stay in Spain, Italy 
Andorra on a mountain for starting an altitude camp uh, and they were not allowed to leave that space anymore. So uh, a few of them are still there. And that's really hard. So some some important discussions were about uh, the mental strength of the guys and we don't want to get a lot of mental stress during these weeks. So the first thing we try around training is even if it's only for a few hours or short sessions, uh, how to find out if they're having fun on the bike. So the first question to riders: is, what do you want to do yourself? What do you like? Uh, how do you like it? Questions like this. And from there, we start to make a, a kind of a plan. Um, and for the guys who, like I said, who stay in, in Holland and they're allowed to go outside for uh, just solo rides, which is just fine. Even for them, it's it's quite limited because uh, the advice from our doctors and I think in general the opinion from medical specialists is um, not to go for the higher intensity. So just keep the volume just low or medium and also the intensity for every training session not too high. So if you do some higher intensity stuff, then of course... It's followed by an easy day or just a, a day off to recover. And don't put too much stress on uh, your mental health. And that's uh, that's really important. That's key for our plans. Um, when I started with the guys who are going on the road, I said, okay, I'd like to make a plan 50% like free practice. You can, you can play with duration and intensity. And 50%, we just focus on maintenance, like uh, FTP work and just kind of a low, low profile VO2. Like I said, just to maintain, we don't want to lose uh, all the things we've built up during the winter and, and pre-season in February. So that, that's basically uh, uh, the general plan. And of course, guys come back and say, okay, instead of 50-50, I'd like to have uh, 70%. Uh, just a strict plan to follow because they like it, they're used to it and for some guys it's the opposite they just like to have the freedom and if the sun is shining like it did uh, the past weeks in Holland which is pretty special for April but we had some good weeks and of course I can understand that a cyclist like to go outside, just take his bike and, and go for a four hour ride without any efforts and you can imagine if you go on uh, on the tax trainer, you take your Neo and you have to stay inside. Yeah, then you prefer to have to do some efforts because then you're not focusing on the time, you're focusing more on the efforts to do. So, uh, yeah, that's basically the biggest difference in, uh, in the training plans. And how do you plan that now for the changes that keep coming up, maybe in the UCI calendar or when racing is going to start again? The date might keep shifting how do you how do you yeah take that into account when making that program is there enough time at some point for riders to get fit how long do they need etc yeah i was a bit afraid in the beginning um that there showed up a big gap between uh those guys of course um because the training volume um uh, variates between uh six hours and uh, 26 hours a week <laughs> which is pretty uh Pretty much, of course, but uh, take into account that we're hoping that most of the guys, at least 95% of the team, are allowed within two weeks to start uh, training outside, even when it's limited, because I can imagine that it, it could be that you're limited in time, that you're not allowed to go outside for six hours, but even if it's only two or three hours, it's just fine to start. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty similar to how you start in, in November with the winter plans. So that's not a big deal. So uh, let's say if the guys start within two weeks, from there, halfway down, may, uh, let's say, focus starting the season in, in the first of uh, September, let's say, or the end of August. I think uh, we don't have to be afraid that it's not enough time to, to get in the right shape. I think it's uh, being patient, um, build up kind of the same way as you do in November and start from there. And uh, take into account that the guys who maintained already uh, in Holland, Belgium, etc., those, those guys can go specific from 
even if it's uh, if it's tomorrow, they can go specific, and they need another three four weeks to get race ready. So um, yeah, I think for both of the groups, it's a different approach, but there's enough time to reach uh, the race readiness in uh, let's say the second part of August, if it's um, going into the right direction to start. And um, yeah, I'm I'm looking around at other sports what they're doing because uh, the German soccer league is preparing a, a restart and also the formula one uh in austria they're working with the uh, red bull in the lead uh working on a kind of isolation with all the the people and staff involved in the race weekends uh to bring them in the hotels uh, owned by the uh, the red bull bus and do the corona checks so if they're all negative they can be isolated all together and stay together for the whole race weekend and then maybe try to do uh, two single race weekends so for us that's really interesting to follow as well as the soccer league maybe uh, not even in germany but maybe more countries are trying a restart again so these experiences are really important for cycling and i think it's good that the uci pointed, let's say, late August as a realistic restart again. Um, so we need some time because uh, I think it's quite challenging to to kind of isolate uh, the cycling world because a lot of people are involved. And if you travel around, you have to stay in hotels. And also uh, there's a lot of staff around and also people working in the hotels. Uh, they should be involved in, yeah, let's say, the complete isolation. So... That's a big challenge, but I think uh, this challenging time brings also creative ideas from creative people. And I'm hoping for that, that they find a solution. And yeah, I think as well as the cyclists, also uh, our staff members are really, really uh, keen on uh, going back into races again. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting to see how that's all going to pan out and it's, uh, how it's going to unfold. Um, if if you look at like how you're coaching your guys and in terms of the volume, you mentioned there's a big difference in hours. Is there a certain ratio that you take into account for like one hour on the tax is equivalent to maybe an hour and 15 minutes on the road or something like that? Or um, No, that completely depends on, uh, on the intensity. I think everybody who follows the indoor racing now uh, knows about swift races. And also uh, our guys uh, joined a lot of those races. And if you see the power data from those races, it's it's uh, it's pretty similar to a time trial, especially uh, a Haley course that's kind of a, uh, a similar strategy to uh, a climbing TT. Let's say uh, if you climb the Mont Ventoux, there's only sometimes a few seconds of recovery, kind of recovery. But um, yeah, it's like 50 to 60 minutes, really high power and um, even when they're, I have to say, not in top shape, which is impossible at the moment, uh, a lot of guys are really, really close or even at the, the level of some records around 45 or even 60 minutes. So it's really, really hard. So it's, uh, it's comparable to a to one hour TT session on the road. But for me, it's hard to say, OK, it's... Uh, it's easier to do one hour on the on the tax on racing on Swift compared to three hours on the road. It just depends on the intensity. But my biggest conclusion is it's really, really hard if you join those races. And take into account, uh, talking about the immune system nowadays, it's, um, it's really important to have enough recovery uh, after doing such a race. So we're really paying a lot of attention to that. So we don't want to do uh, day in, day out uh, kind of sessions like these. We really like to use the tech sessions and, and use the, the, the builder uh, to make the training sessions and kind of manage the, the training load. So, um, for example, um, do the efforts with enough recovery in between. The repetitions are not too many in number and not too hard in intensity it's just to maintain what they built in in strength or just basic condition uh, in the months before 
And if we link that to the amateur or recreational cyclist out there who is now maybe indoors doing a lot of those, uh, maybe races as well, um, is it even more important for them in terms of recovery to take it? And with regards to the immune system of how do you see that? What would you say to them? Yeah, I think uh, amateur racers are, compared to our pros, are not used uh, to do so many high intensity stuff. So I think uh, even if it sounds really challenging for those guys, you have to pay attention that the, the, the training load is not too high um, according to the immune system because uh, yeah, that's, that's the, main, uh, the main thing. Uh, the health is key in this, in this period. So um, for me, it's better if you do, let's say, three sessions a week that, of course, one can be kind of a hard one. But even if it's hard, it's not like a full gas effort. And the other two are more endurance based. So that's our, uh, how we manage it in, in our team, but also as an advice for, let's say, amateur riders. And now uh, you, you've been so kind to, uh, to put on like a three-week plan, which uh, people can find at, uh, at the tax website if they go to blog.tax.com um, to, so they can follow their own like three-week t- uh, training plan designed by you. What were the components that you put in there? What is the, the, the philosophy behind that? Program? Yeah, it's based on three weeks, like you said, uh, three times a week. It's based on indoor sessions, but of course you can do it outside. Um, you have to take into account that one of the training sessions is uh, slow frequency reps. That's, uh, these are efforts, four times six minute efforts with RPM between 60 and 70. So that's kind of strength training. Um, and you can imagine that it's easier if you have uh, kind of a, a slightly uphill course to do that because you need to create enough resistance to, pu- to push the power and, and do that with kind of a slow speed. So you can imagine you do that with really um, uh, hard headwind and a big gear. But if it's not, which is <laughs> also uh, realistic, um, it's better to do it on a, on a hill. So you need a few K slightly uphill. Um, but of course, it's, it's, uh, it's really easy to control that uh, on, a, on a Tax Neo. So I prefer those efforts uh, to do those indoor and you can control it, you can compare it. And, and of course, after a few weeks, you want to track the uh, improvement. And that's really easy because if you compare the same efforts and you're wearing a, you're checking your heart rate, wearing a belt then you can easily check and track if the heart rate with the same power is a bit lower than how you started in the first week so i really prefer those efforts to do indoor on the on the tax trainers so that's for the for the strength sort of like the strength work what yeah. are the other two sessions that, that are in the week the other sessions uh, one is uh, a mix of endurance and tempo endurance i wrote two uh, set up so you can easily do this outside of course based on endurance it's really easy to go outside uh, if you do it inside I built blocks like uh, 2 times 12 minutes to start with if you go outside it's easier to spread the efforts uh, over uh, a bit longer time so then you can do 3 times 10 minutes and the thing we have created is uh, it's based on work an effort workout to do 50 seconds seated, 10 seconds standing. So even if it's not the highest intensity, um, it's really good to get your body and the legs used to different positions. Because imagine you go for a longer climb during the summer and you have a big challenge going to the Alp US or things like that. You have to go into the rhythm um, to stay seated for a certain amount of time, seconds, and then stand up when it's getting a little bit harder. So um, it's really good to make a good combination of standing and seated and change that every now and then. So it's based on tempo, based on 
75, 85% of FTP power. And then standing, of course, that's a little bit more, but not like full sprinting. That's just a short peak, which is could be around threshold or maybe a bit over threshold. And then the development between those weeks, going from week one to two, then we're going to extend both of the periods seeded from 50 to 70 and 10 seconds standing from 10 to 20 seconds. And there's another step coming in the final third week. And then we have 90 seconds and 30 seconds for seated and standing. So make it a little bit more challenging. And, and there you can see and track the development for yourself if the 30 seconds in the end feels as easy as the 10 seconds from how you started in the first week. And then the third one, that's the in, uh, intensity, the, the highest one, that's FTP development. It's based on three sets and every set contains three times three minutes. In week one, the recovery time between those three minutes is also three minutes and going from week one to two um, and two to the third week, then the recovery time is going shorter and shorter from three minutes, two minutes, and the final week is only one minute. It sounds really challenging because relatively those steps in recovery are pretty big. And that's why my advice is to keep the control in the first set that you don't overdo the power and you just feel still comfortable and realize that you should do this for two other sets more. Um, and it's more important to maintain the same power instead of losing the power and, 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 and get really fatigued in the end. So consistency over the sets is it's, it's the most important. So keep control on the first one that you're really able to manage it till the end of the training. That's, that's the key in this session because it's, uh, it could be a really hard one. All right, awesome. So it's strength, basically a strength session, endurance session, and a threshold session. Yeah. Are those, are those like the three key ingredients for every training program that you ride? Um, yeah, of course, but um, especially in this period when it's all about m low or medium intensity. And of course, the next step going into the race readiness for the pro riders we have in the team. So focusing on the months August and September um, in the current situation, we're going to change the trainings uh, in, in uh, let's say, June, July, early August. We're going to change that. And then you're going to play with uh, sometimes a lower volume and more like hit sessions where the intensity is really, really high and, and focus on full sprints where you need a lot of more recovery. Um, but that's really race specific. And, and then, of course, you don't have the time to put this same amount of uh, volume and, and, and FTP endurance work in. So we're going to reduce that. And then it's also about repeat these sessions only once in a few days or, or in a week instead of doing that three times a week. Then it's only important to repeat that to not lose the capacity of what you built in the weeks and months before. Okay, cool. So, but in general, like for this period, especially also for the, for the amateur cyclist, strength, endurance, threshold, great building workouts. And uh, yeah, be care, be aware of your recovery and make sure that you stay yeah, healthy. That's yeah, the main yeah, thing, right? Yeah. So in, in training, you always play with intensity and, and volume. So um, our advice is, for both of the things, because a lot of volume brings also a lot of stress in the on the immune system. And, and of course, also the intensity, which is really easy to understand, uh, gives a lot of uh, pressure on that system. So uh, both of these factors uh, should be limited in this period. Um, so we say, OK, we, we don't do 30 hours a week crazy on a bike and we not go to uh, really... Uh, long hit sessions, uh, interval sessions on the highest intensity. So we don't do that. Sometimes if we hit uh, a short record or whatever, 
it's in combination with longer recovery or a day off afterwards or things like that. Because you can't avoid having uh, some fun on the bike that you, you're touching your uh, five-minute record or two-minute or one-minute or you do some sprints. That's not a big deal, but um, it's more important that you don't do that every other day or ten times in the training. That's, it's important to recover uh, immediately after that. So in the, train, in the training itself, to build enough uh, recovery in or the next day having a full recovery day. That's, uh, that's to, to keep an eye on. And, and I think uh, the general plan should be based on, on efforts and sessions till uh, threshold. Then you're, yeah, let's say, then you're always safe and, and have enough recovery and to keep your, your health in the right way in this period of um, having the virus still around. All right, awesome, great advice. Uh, yeah, I want to move on to the Tux Turbo Talks fan question of the week because each week uh, we have questions coming in for our guest. And this week, the main question that came in, or really great one, was from Stefan Larsen. And he wanted to know from you, uh, what is the biggest misconception regarding training of pro riders from all the information that can be found online? Um, phew, that's a, that's yeah. First of all, a good question, of course. I think um, when I was a young rider, I was always reading and looking at the at the pros, of course, which is uh, yeah, which is pretty logical to do. Um, but I think the misconception could be that a good training session uh, to get a pro rider ready for racing with having a different background in training, so over the years, but also uh, short term in months, that background is when it's completely different from, let's say an amateur rider who's working or studying or um, uh, physically a different background, that the effect of the same training sessions uh, will work out completely different. So, um, I think everybody in cycling um, remembered that Bjarne Ries was really keen on doing 40-20 intervals. And of course, um, it sounds really great and everybody has to do interval to get race ready. But uh, you need to have a good background, a solid condition before start doing those things and get the benefits out of that. Because it's based on the condition that the effect of the training is good enough uh, to improve instead of getting worse or feeling worse. So I think the misconception uh, is, is that you cannot compare the same training session, that it will work out the same for different riders. I think um, that's a misconception. And um, I think it's, like I said, it's pretty logical that you have some examples and you're looking for the winner of uh, Liège or Roubaix did this effort. So that's great. But don't forget that he was training uh, four weeks before on altitude or he did a camp where he did a volume block of 30 hours and then had some recovery for four days and then started high intensity stuff. Um, and then the high intensity stuff brings you the right effect. But if you do that for too long without having any background uh, in way of uh, solid condition, then it's not going to work out the same. So I think um, that's the misconception about it. All right. Great. Awesome. I think we're going to slowly wrap it up here. Um, but not before, let's say that the, the racing starts again, uh, maybe late August, early September. Which EF pro cycling rider is going to surprise the rest of the cycling world? Um, ooh, that's really hard for me because I'm, I'm looking from inside and for me, there's not any surprise if the guys go well. <laughs> I see how they're training and how motivated they are. So, um, ooh, that's, uh, that's a hard question. Um, yeah, let's say I think in general, um, I think the guys who are really mentally strong, they need to see biggest the biggest opportunities because 
you can imagine that uh, a lot of experienced guys, they can see it like this, like I've done uh, 10 great seasons in cycling and this is one of the most complicated situations I've dealt with. So they might have lost some, some concentration. So I think this will bring some big opportunities for guys um, if the if the key riders, the experienced guys, are not there in in some let's say one day races, because I'm looking for those opportunities uh, more in in one day classics compared to uh, two or three week races, because for three week races uh, there's no possible chance of having like a, a new star in born in, in a few weeks because those efforts are really so specific and you need such a, a big history in climbing uh, to be in the top five in the Grand Tour that yeah. it's hard to imagine having a big surprise there. But I can imagine um, we're going to see some really young, talented, uh, let's say no-name riders in in one day races and we also have some some young guys really motivated talented guys in the team i'm not gonna tell any specific name but um <laughs> i can reckon the, the the situation will bring some new young riders uh in in the one day races that's that's for sure all right awesome at least that's something uh, to look forward to in the hopefully the next couple of months um, and for the riders, obviously, and the amateur, the fans at home, they've got uh, something else to look forward to. And that's that three-week training plan that, uh, that you wrote for them. And they can find it on blog.tax.com. Uh, Peter, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, really, I think, really interesting for our listeners. A lot of wisdom there. So thanks for sharing that. No worries. With pleasure. And uh, thanks for jumping on. And people, if you're listening, don't forget to tell a friend about this podcast and tell a friend about that program that they can follow online. And in the meantime, make sure you never stop cycling. It's time to wrap it up here. This was Rob Bauer with Peter Schep of EF Pro Cycling. Stay tuned for the next Tax Turbo Talks.